So if you want to read along, feel free to look up there. The, uh, as I said, I, I previously did this space, but I didn't record it. And it was pretty interesting, so I'll record it now. Uh, if you want to know where those screenshots are from, uh, it's from the Phoenix Pre-Socratics uh, copy of uh, Parmenides' Fragments. I got it in my hand here. It's just photographs of it. It's a really good little book, honestly. It, um, it gives you a short introduction essay that I think is... I mean, like I said, it's short and it's to the point and it's pretty lucid and I don't really have any personal problems with the way they introduce the text. I think it's really helpful and I think anyone can follow it. It's It, it doesn't require any prior knowledge of the text or ancient Greece or anything to follow the introduction. So it's a great little introductory work with a really nice introduction essay. And then the fragments are just, um, as you can see in the pictures, are presented really clearly. Uh, you have the ancient Greek on one side, and then you have the English on the other. And then what's really nice is um, the the person who did the main translation, his name's David Gallup, um, but he has also included uh, multiple alternative translations uh, throughout the text. So if there's a line um, that you think is particularly important, not only do you have the original um, and then the um, and then David Gallup's translation, but depending on the line, uh, you may find you have multiple translations into English from other uh, professors or authors, and um, you know it's just very it's a very nice addition, and um, it just helps you understand the text better when every important or popular line that gets discussed a lot has like five different translations and also the Greek right next to it. So it's 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 very nice little uh, book, and it's pretty you know like I said we only have a third of Parmenides' work, so it's not like a huge tome. And um, they also include a lot of testimonia, like uh, later thinkers discussing Parmenides rather than direct quotes. Um, but it's all it's all really well put together. I'd recommend to anyone who's new to Parmenides or or just needs a copy of his work, check out the Phoenix Pre-Socratics. Um, and also, you know, I mentioned there's the Greek on the side there. Just to be very clear, um, my ancient Greek is extremely poor and limited. I don't read the text in ancient Greek. I read it in the English translation, and I only reference the Greek if I need to know if a particular word is being used in a particular place, or, you know, if there's some very specific question, yes, I can read the Greek alphabet, and I know some of the words, and I can go do some research on it, but, but generally speaking, I'm, like many of you, using translations, and just really nice when you have a text that will give you multiple different translations and the original text to reference if you need. Um, so, so that's me hawking up Phoenix Pre-Socratics or talking them up, but it's really, really quite nice. The um, For today, we're just going to read the proem. Uh, it's just those three pages photographed. It's really not that long, um, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of details in there that I think if your goal is to understand or interpret the poem as a whole, uh, because there's a lot of debates, like what does Parmenides or the goddess really mean? Like what, what is the true meaning of her words or a revelation um, or Eleatic philosophy generally? The proem, this, this beginning section, I think works into that argument uh, in some important ways. And I think if you're going to argue about the correct way to interpret the text, uh, it's really worth taking an interest in the proem. Whereas the first time I read this text, um, I didn't care so much for the proem. Um, essentially, the proem is a story of... There's a youth, and these maidens of the sun, they go out to collect him in a chariot and bring him to meet a goddess um, at a place where the day meets the night. There's a big gateway there. And then the goddess gives him this revelation or this philosophical lesson. Um, so... You know, if you are strictly looking for a philosophical argument or, or some sort of argument about the nature of what is, maybe the first time reading the text, you just kind of skip over that and you don't pay attention to it because it's just sort of like the lead in of, hey, there's this young man, he's taken on a chariot, he meets a goddess, and now we're going to get into the meat of the, of the work. And that's kind of true. I mean, the goddess, he meets her and then she gives him the revelation, but... But there's, I think, a lot of interesting clues or material in the proem that's definitely worth slowly reading through and considering if you're ever going to get into a discussion about what is the true meaning of uh, 
of Eleatic philosophy or of Parmenides' work or the goddess's revelation. Uh, because very often you'll argue about, well, how are we to understand what is? Um, how are we to understand the fact that it is indivisible or homogenous or um, unchanging? And I think maybe it's not just me. I think many people would say, well, you also have to consider the things described in the proem um, because, you know, presumably the things that occur in the proem are possible or make sense or somehow are, are, are meaningful in, in terms of this world view or account of reality that's being put forward. Um, and I have my own interpretation, but just by way of introduction, before we jump into the text, be aware there's a number of different interpretations. Uh, Parmenides, Parmenides, obviously, he's a what, late 6th century thinker, or at least he was born in the late 6th century. The um, So that's a good 2,500 years there. Uh, so he's been commented on a lot. Um, I'll give you a few interpretations that I encounter in the secondary sources. Oh, I see we have a request for a mic. And, and I haven't mentioned it yet, but anyone who wants to ask a question or make a comment or something, feel free to request the mic. Like I said, this is a casual read through. It's not like I'm giving a lecture from a podium and demanding silence or anything or giving some very, very well prepared and deep insight. Uh, it's me reading it and highlighting things. But uh, if you want to talk or ask a question, just request it. And I'm, I'm pretty open. I'll try to keep things on track, but here we go. Um, what is this? Nelson. Here we go. There you go. You should have the mic. So, uh, whoops. Oh, there we go. So feel free to, feel free to speak, Nelson. Uh, Nelson, feel free to uh, ask a question or make a comment. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'll try to come back. I just came into the whole screen. But, uh, what you guys have been actually talking about, driving, so exterior noise. But, uh, glad to have joined. Maybe next time. Yeah, no worries, mate. The... Um, I don't want to cause a traffic accident, so <laughs> I'll let you focus on the road, mate. The, uh, if you have any questions or comments, just put your hand up. I look at the screen every so often, and, and I'll catch them. The um, All I'll do before we jump into the text, I was basically just giving an introduction and, and telling people that if they wanted a good introductory copy of Parmenides' work to check out the Phoenix pre-Socratics version. Um, but the last thing I'll say is that there are a few different interpretations so don't take my words as gospel or the absolute truth or the the one true meaning of the goddess's revelation uh because parmenides has been around for 2500 years or so uh, and there's a ton of um secondary source material from the modern day and also all of the thinkers after parmenides kind of comment on him he's a major figure in philosophy um so you have sort of a very strict monist perspective on him uh, by this, I mean, people will interpret the revelation as saying that reality or being is just one complete thing, and it's unchanging, indivisible, uh, homogenous. Um, and I call it very strict because the people that are very strict about this, they will deny any sort of meaning or detail to reality. Um, it's almost like reality is just a... Um, a monotone hum or spher spherical blob of like sludge or isness and there's no detail or meaning to it because in their interpretation to to posit detail is almost like positing parthood or dividing it up like a you and a me so in that interpretation they they deny any sort of complexity or detail to being um i see you got your hand up nelson uh feel free to chat Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question or a comment, Nelson. All right, well, I'll, I'll continue. The um, I think you ought to focus on driving, mate. I hope you haven't crashed and your hand's just up in the air because you can't put it back down. The um, So that's a very strict monist interpretation. I think it's pretty popular as well. Um, if you go to like a... You know, when was the first time I encountered Eleatics? Probably like Zeno in geometry class or something back in middle school or high school. Um, because you have them say, the geometry teacher will get up and say, 
oh, how can you reach the end of a line because there's a halfway point and then a halfway point and a halfway point. And uh, it's unchanging and the idea of a beginning and an end is meaningless and there's just, you know, it's just unintelligible, meaningless stuff and it's just what is and the end. Um, but this sort of, this sort of very strict monist denial of any parthood or meaning or detail or complexity to what is, uh, is one popular interpretation. Uh, another one you find in, um, which is also, I mean, the first one there to some limited degree is ancient and the next one is also ancient. We see a dualist model. So someone like Simplicius who preserves the longest of the fragments and, and a fair bit of the work and also Simplicius uh, preserves other Eleatics like Melissus. The, um, he is like late Roman Imperial, but the reason why I'm picking him out is because he, he gives an interpretation of Parmenides' work uh, when he's commenting on Aristotle's uh, physics and uh, book one of the physics. And Simplicius represents uh, Parmenides as a dualist. So for Parmenides, uh, Simplicius is saying the meaning of this text is that there is being or the truth and it's all those things, you know, unchanging, indivisible, homogenous, etc. And then there's the um, the way of seeming or the realm of, of uh, doxa or seeming or change. And it's kind of a sort of inferior shadow world or illusory world of change. Uh, so you almost get a sort of two-tone or dualist account of reality in that interpretation. So we've gone from that first interpretation I put forward, which is, you know, they're just is there's just this one complete thing called being and it's completely und indivisible and homogenous and everything and all complexity is gone and, and that's all there is just this spherical blob of isness or this monotone isness and then you have this two-tone sort of okay there is the unchanging eternal isness or truth and then there's also this world of seeming or change or shadows or illusions uh, so you get this sort of almost dualist model and you sometimes see that model is also kind of popular. I've seen it from, um, sometimes when I'm discussing things with like um, people who are into medieval philosophy, it seems it, it survived into the early church and, and medieval church, um, both Eastern and Western. It seems they had this kind of dualist understanding of Parmenides. Uh, it's not really my real house medieval stuff, but sometimes I see them quoting um, early church texts and, and it seems to have this interpretation. And I find the interpretation in late imperial stuff like Simplicius. And also if you look at Aristotle and stuff, I'm not saying Aristotle treats Parmenides the same way Simplicius does, but Aristotle will say, you know, there's, there's being, but there's also, you know, um, fire and darkness are principles of it. Um, we have people in this chat already that know Aristotle much better than I do. I haven't read any Aristotle recently, um, but um, I do sometimes read his fragments or his sections on Parmenides and Melissus in the context of trying to understand Parmenides and Melissus and also Zeno uh, and also Diodorus Cronus. Um, so Aristotle comes up a fair bit and Aristotle seems to have, if not a dualist understanding of Parmenides, at least an understanding of Parmenides where, yes, its its reality is this being set in one way and absolutely, but it seems to also have some principles. It's not, I've had it pointed out to me, kind of interesting, that it's not clear what Parmenides' text looked like for Aristotle. Like what copy did Aristotle have? Because it's not always clear that Aristotle is making a, a divide between what we would call the the path of truth and the and the path of seeming, uh, like these two sections of the poem after the proem. Um, so it's, it's an interesting wrinkle. It's, it, I'd be curious if anyone has strong opinions on how Aristotle received the text and how aware he was of our division of it from a, a way of truth and then a way of seeming. Um, but those are two popular ones. So we've got a strict monist one and we've got a dualist one. I think you'll encounter those. Uh, and then one that, uh, the last one I'll mention, is uh, one that you'll find uh, it's new, as far as I know, it's, it's new. It's not really in ancient texts. Uh, it started with American academia. Um, it sounds like a, a professor named uh, Kurd, Pro Professor Kurd, uh, some decades ago came up with an interpretation, uh, whether it was from her or she popularized it, um, 
is essentially saying this text is not about an overall view of reality as being one thing or being this uh, one unchanging true realm and a realm of shadows. It's not about that. It's not trying to give you an account of all of reality. In Professor Kurd, and um, I got a book here from uh, Professor McKirahan, he also seems to have taken this route. The um, They seem to be interpreting it, these American professors, um, and I'm sure there's more of them, um, they seem to be interpreting it rather as a goddess saying, look, this is the criteria of what it means to exist, or what it means to be true or to be something. And what does it mean to exist or to be? It means to be indivisible, unchanging, homogenous, etc. And so what they're saying is uh, Parmenides, or the goddess, is putting forward an account of the criteria something has to meet in order to qualify as existing or being true or whatever. And so actually you can have as many of those things as you want, um, but they have to meet this criteria to be true or to have isness. Um, now, I obviously that's far from what I believe the text says, but I'm not going to pretend that I'm, like I said earlier, I'm not like some great exegete or understander of Greek or something. So I'm not going to try and tell you which of these three interpretations you should follow or what to make of this newer interpretation from it seems to be coming from american academia um and and you know like i said i'm not going to tell you it's wrong because i'm not really in that position to tell you the one true meaning uh, but it is a very unique take and um if you go down that road you you know you can almost i don't want to say better appreciate but you'll notice when you read um pre-socratic or archaic philosophers that post date Parmenides. Uh, what do you see them often do? They often posit these building blocks of reality that are indivisible and unchanging. Um, so if you look at Empedocles, it's like, okay, we have Empedocles. What does he say about the, the elements that he posits? These building blocks of everything. Oh, the elements are undying, eternal. You know, they don't break down into something smaller. Now, they get rearranged in various ways and make new things and then pass away, uh, which I think is its own problem. But, you know, maybe some of these pre-Socratics had a similar view of, of what Parmenides was saying because they still think they can rearrange stuff and have change in a certain way, um, but they are now positing these fundamental building blocks that don't break down further. Um, now, I don't think that's the whole story because Empedocles... Um, I don't have his work in front of me, although the Phoenix Pre-Socratics does have a nice copy of Empedocles. Um, but somewhere in there, he, he does say, you know, how can it be that these various things change or get rearranged? And it gets chalked up to divine, you know, it's like a divine thing, like a mystery. And to me, that would suggest he knows there's an issue with it. Um, but, but anyway, I just want to say, here is this third newer American and interesting um, perspective on what maybe the goddess is trying to do. And it's not existential or, you know, overall picture of reality, but rather an, an account of what something needs in order to qualify as existing. I don't, you know, flat out, I don't think it's right. I think they're wrong. I don't, and, and even if they are right, then I would just say Parmenides and the goddess are wrong because I don't believe that answers the fundamental questions and I don't like that interpretation. But it's out there and, and you, you'll probably encounter it if you read um, any of the secondary source material on Parmenides from uh, American professors, like um, I mentioned Professor McKirahan, because I'm reading through some of his, um, well, I read through some of his essays uh, where he's, he's Aristotelianizing Parmenides in his words, and also Professor Kurd and others. Uh, I don't know any of these people, and I'm not in academia, so I, I don't personally have any professional or personal connection to any of it but it's what you'll encounter so there's three interpretations um like i said you'll encounter them i'm not going to tell you why or if they're correct or not even if i could um but when we read through this right now i just want to let you know i'm going to be picking out things that are of particular interest to me uh, because i have my own belief i i feel like the eleatic works are very inspiring um and very obviously historically influential but also influential on the way i think about the world uh so 
you know, I do think that reality is one perfectly complete whole. Uh, I think reality is just one thing, like one perfect and complete whole. And I think that one point there, reality is complete, you know, it's perfectly complete. I think that is the core belief or the um, inherent or necessary element of what makes an Eleatic an Eleatic. And all that stuff about it's unchanging, it's indivisible, it's homogenous, it's, you know, all those things I think flow from that one core belief, uh, you know, that there is what there is, there's just, there just is, it's this complete, perfect world of what is. Uh, so I think it all flows from that one core belief. Uh, I do know other thinkers will say there's a couple or a few core beliefs that those teachings about indivisibility and whatnot flow from. Uh, but in my understanding, the Eleatics are talking about an account of reality um, as a whole and not just a criteria of what it means to be a thing, um, a true thing. Um, but also that the one core belief that unifies them all and that they cannot sort of waffle on or like doubt is that reality really is a perfect and complete whole. There's nothing, it couldn't become anything else because there's nothing else to be, there just is, and it's complete and perfect, and that's the end of the story. Um, and so when I when I go through this, that's, that's the interpretation I have in mind, and that's gonna color the sections that I pick out and that I comment on, because it helps my philosophical project, and I find those sections particularly inspiring and meaningful. Uh, but I'm not of the interpretation that this one perfect and complete whole or being is lacking any complexity or detail or meaning uh my parmenides is, is like a parmenides of meaning it's not just saying that there is and you can't say anything about what is i think that if you say that there only is what there is uh, and that reality is this perfect complete whole that is all that is then everything you perceive and everything you latch onto, whatever you can say with certainty it has to be included in that perfect whole. Like, you can't be outside of it. And I don't see the point in trying to deny it. You could say you describe it poorly, in which case you're just talking gibberish or nonsense, but but to the extent that you perceive something, it has to be part of what is, or, and I use part, I kind of hold myself, because I know that's a term that would be bickered about whether or not being has parthood. Um, but whatever meaning there is, it is in what is. Uh, and so I don't go down the road of denying all meaning or, or that sort of thing, uh, which is sometimes what you'll encounter in these interpretations. They'll deny all meaning. Um, but yep, yeah, so that's, um, that's some popular interpretations of my interpretation. Um, again, Phoenix Pre-Socratics is, is what I think is the best introductory text for newcomers. And also, even if you're not a newcomer, I just, I like the intro essay. It's just nice and helpful and um, it's not that long and I really don't have any strong disagreements or things that I kind of yell at the book until the very end of it and even then it's probably just me being unreasonable it's, it's a pretty nice introduction the um, but anyway let's I've, I've been talking too long let's just hop into the text I'll read it and um, I'm going to um, stop myself every so often when I when I find a section I like and you know just like the last time I don't have like a big set of notes or anything the one thing i did that that i didn't do last time is i went and grabbed a copy of um i have it says kathleen freeman as we put it together it's the ancilla to the pre-socratic philosophers because there's a section in the proem that reminded me of um anaximander or anaximander or however his name is pronounced and so i went and actually got that section so we can we can read that as well i don't have it up in the top of the space there but i'll just read it when we get to that section and again, uh, before I start, just remember, this is the proem. It's the beginning of Parmenides' work, which is in three sections. And it's going to describe how the youth is brought to the goddess. Um, and then is about to, you know, when he reaches a goddess, he's going to get this revelation about um, what is or being and uh, what that entails. And so it starts here. Oh, I, I guess I should say, you know, late 6th century guy, born late 6th century, so 2,500 years ago. Um, he's writing in poetic fashion, like an epic, like Homer or something, but 
just so you're aware that that there is prose or essays written in ancient Greek uh, prior to Parmenides writing this. So it's not like he had to write in a poem. Um, I mentioned Anaximander. The, um, he writes, for example, in prose, apparently. Um, he's not very well preserved. There's just like arguably three sentences preserved directly. Um, but the, uh, he's not writing in like an epic poem format. Uh, there's another guy you might want to look into. He's a Pythagorean. Um, well, I guess you might even call him Proto-Pythagorean. I think he might be older than Pythagoras. Pythagoras is not really my wheelhouse, but the uh, Pherakides. Um, so Pherakides is, is sometimes thought of as the first person to write in essay format in ancient Greek. Either, well, maybe not the first, but the oldest preserved. There's some lines from Pherakides. They, they wound up digging up some fragments somewhere. The, um, so, so, he, so Parmenides could have written in essay format. And I didn't mention about Parmenides uh, is born. Well, he, there's not much known about Parmenides' life. He lives in Italy, essentially in Greater Greece, in, in southern Italy, in Elea. Um, and I know we've all been um, going along with the spaces on um, Costin's work uh, about the origins of philosophy and selective breeding or whatnot. Um, I think one interesting point, and having not read all that book and not being too active in the spaces, just because I haven't read the book, the um, I think it's interesting that a lot of these archaic philosophers are from the marches of the Greek world. What I mean, like the outer borders of the Greek cultural sphere. So um, Parmenides, um, Empedocles is in Sicily, Empedocles, um, but they're out on the western marches of the Hellenic world. And then um, you have people like Anaximander and the Ionians out on the eastern marches uh, in modern coast of Turkey. And the... Um, so it's interesting, these, these earliest philosophers are born in colonial city-states uh, with a great deal of contact with, um, you know, they're right on the marches of the Hellenic world, and, and so they're in a very cosmopolitan place. Um, but I just, I just add that as an aside. There's not much known about Parmenides' life, so I don't have anything amazing to say. Some people say he was a Pythagorean, and then he decided they were wrong and did his own thing. Some people say he was taught by uh, Xenophanes of Colophon. Um, but, you know, it's not like I have a long biography to share with you about Parmenides. So let's just jump into the poem. I've, I've spoken way too much. <laughs> uh, okay, and uh, if you want to read along, just open it. It's up there at the top of the space. Fragment 1 from Parmenides on Nature. The mares that carry me as far as impulse might reach were taking me when they brought and placed me upon the much-speaking route of the goddess that carries everywhere unscathed the man who knows. So first three lines there, but already for my purposes, there's a very special line here. So, and I'm going to be doing this throughout the text, so sorry if you just want me to read through the whole thing, I'm just going to be pausing constantly to pick out these really interesting details at least interesting to me. So I told you it's a, it's a youth being taken by a chariot to go visit a goddess, right? So we have, you know, the mares that carry me. Well, he's, he's on a chariot, as we'll find out. And um, they brought and placed me upon the much-speaking route. So it looks like in the ancient Greek we have, uh, again, I don't have any notes or anything, but I have the book in my hand. It looks like a polyphemon, so much-speaking route. And if you look in the screenshot, and why I really like this translation, you can go down, and it says it has three different translations for us, which is really nice, right? We have resounding road, renowned way, or route of much speaking. And the reason why I'm picking this out is because that term poly there, or much speaking route, much, the many, I want to show that being, in some sense, we must be allowed to speak of it as uh, having much meaning or plurality or detail to it. And so already, the chariot that's carrying him to see the goddess, what route is it placing him on? Well, it's the route of the goddess, so it's the goddess's route, and it's much speaking, or, yeah, a resounding, so it could just mean a lot of sound. Um, but, depending on how it gets read, there, there's 
many details or many voices or much speaking to it. So it seems like it's a path with a lot of words or a lot of meaning or a lot of sound to it. Uh, so this, this is just one little line that I would pick out and say, look, it's the road of the goddess and it involves polyphemon. So, uh, you know, if I wanted to make an argument about a detailed being or a, a plurality somehow being admissible, um, that to me is, is a nice bit to, to cling on to there because it's of the goddess and it shows that there has to be uh, much of something, not just one of something or no detail whatsoever. So there we go. Um, it carries everywhere unscathed the man who knows. You know, the the man who knows, there must be some significance to that, but, but see how it says carries everywhere. Um, later on in this poem, we're going to be seeing that the mind is sort of not detached from anywhere because whatever you think of, it's right there at hand, right? Like I want to think about Pluto, it's right at my, right in my mind right away. It's, um, and so this, ro this route of the goddess, it's like everything is there immediately and always. And this route carries everywhere unscathed the man who knows. So it's like the goddess's route or her truth perhaps is carrying things everywhere or reaches everywhere. So I think that's also uh, not only speaking to how this route touches on all detail or every detail uh, or extends everywhere. Uh, but again, it's much speaking, and it's of the goddess. Um, so maybe I'm making much uh, do about nothing, but I think those are some important details if you want to argue uh, for a Parmenides of meaning or detail or complexity. Thereon was I carried, for thereon the much-guided mares were carrying me, straining to pull the chariot, and maidens were leading the way. The axle, glowing in its naves, gave forth the shrill sound of a pipe, for it was urged on by two rounded wheels at either end, even while maidens, daughters of the sun, were hastening to escort me, after leaving the house of night for the light, having pushed back with their hands the veils from their heads. Uh, just a brief pause here. This is not... Well, there is something here that does specifically interest me, but there's also some details here that would interest others other than myself. You know, if you are interested in, um, I guess, the Eleusinian mysteries and other mystery cults of the ancient world, there's got to be some interesting information here for you. Um, because he's gone to some trouble describing the axle of the chariot and it's giving the shrill sound of a pipe. And, and what's going on here? The youth is being brought to meet the goddess to receive a revelation or some sort of insight about reality. Now, I'm not that personally involved in, in religious mysteries or ceremonies or rituals, um, but I do know that there's the Eleusinian mysteries and you have the lesser and greater mysteries and, and there's going to be processions and you get shown certain things and you do certain things, right? Um, Dionysius has his... Um, this, you have these sort of Bacchic sort of rites or mysteries as well, um, where people have their, I guess, their plants they hold up there. And, um, you know, the women go off and do their thing in the forests or whatnot. But the, um, what I'm getting at is maybe the, maybe if you are very familiar with what religious processions looked like in the ancient world, you get some meaning here in the way that there's a shrill sound of a pipe and um, someone being pulled in a chariot by maidens, etc. I don't know how much meaning you can get from that, but I think it sets the tone of that, that kind of sets the stage for some great revelation, and I think there must be a lot of points that relate to mystery cults in the ancient world, and I think, um, I know that a number of, of people that I've read source material from, or pri uh, secondary source material from, have thought similarly about it. Now, again, not, not supremely helpful for my philosophical project but i think worth pointing out there there's a reason why he gave such specific detail about the chariot either a showing off its unworldly nature like it's some sort of advanced super chariot uh, or like any demonstration of a very complex chariot because it can make the sound of a pipe and has glowing naves and things so it's kind of showing like this is advanced or divine chariot uh, but also this is kind of a religious procession because it's a youth on a chariot, the sounds of pipes, 
and a maiden carrying him forward uh, or leading them forward. Um, if you do read into some of the secondary source material, you'll see there's a debate about whether these daughters of the sun are leaving the house of night for the light or if they're leaving the house of light and with the youth now heading towards the house of night. Um, so from light to night or night to light, um, there seems to be a bit of a debate about the translation. Uh, I will say that the um, all the translators, and even in antiquity, uh, you'll find that the um, ancient philosophers as well said that he was sort of obscure in the way he wrote, or ambiguous and obscure. So, so I imagine, again, not being the, the Greek translator or being in a position to do that, it does sound like it's quite a challenge at times to translate this text. And uh, that's one of the stumbling blocks uh, that they have to kind of bite the bullet and make a decision on. Uh, but what we'll find is that, that these daughters, whether they're going in one direction or the other, they are ultimately going to come to a gate uh, or a doorway or a meeting place between night and day. And we can see something interesting about that when that happens. But for now, I just wanted to point out, A, the author, Parmenides, is making a big deal about this chariot, saying it's glowing and it makes a shrill sound of a pipe and has two rounded wheels at either end, etc., um, and also he's kind of set the stage as a religious procession in a sort of mystery almost, uh, which is indeed what's going to happen. The youth is going to go speak to the goddess and going to get this revelation. Let's, uh, let me reread the last line just to lead into it. To escort me after leaving the house of night for the light, having pushed back with their hands the veils from their heads. I guess the veils from their heads may also go into that mystery cult and, and this religious procession i don't know the significance of the veils and pushing them back but well i guess revelation right it's a pulling away of a veil um so there you go they pushed uh, back with their hands the veils from their heads so now they can see clearly there are the gates of the paths of night and day and a lintel and a threshold of stone surround them and the ethereal gates themselves are filled with great doors and for these justice much avenging holds the keys of retribution. All right, again, there's um, there's something very interesting for me here. Um, what we have is, where is the chariot going to? It's going to the gates of the paths of night and day. So it's going to where night and day both meet. And there's two really important things that I take from this location. Um, you know, they're going to open the gate and he's going to get through and see the goddess um, at a place kind of beyond the, the gates of night and day. Um, but if we are going from the night to the light or from the light to the day, where is the doorway or the gateway where night and day meet or where light and darkness meet? I don't want to say that Plato... Well, I do want to say Plato was inspired by Parmenides because he was, but also that... He may have been inspired about his um, analogy with the cave, right? Because what is the entranceway of a cave? It's kind of where the light and the dark meet. And so Parmenides is being taken to where the light and the darkness meets, and then he passes through. So he's going into this other realm where he's going to receive the truth. And so I don't want to get into Plato too much, but if you wanted an interesting angle on on what Plato might have been thinking in, in the Republic when he gives this analogy of the cave and exiting the cave. Um, maybe maybe there's some inspiration coming from here where the person who is going to see the truth goes up to the doorway where the light and darkness meet, or the door of a cave, and, um, and they receive something. And not only that, as we read through the text, uh, we'll find that the goddess prepares him to re-enter uh, the mortal realm or where he came from. And what else do we see uh, in Plato? It's this uh, fear or this problem with um, you've seen the truth outside the cave and you want to go back in and tell the people that are still chained up there, but they're going to call you a fool or an idiot. Well, the, the goddess uh, in this poem uh, also says, you know, you're going to have to go back to the mortal realm. Um... But the goddess also knows that he's going to get laughed at or have some trouble when he goes back. Uh, so she equips him with arguments and an account of all the popular scientific theories. So she kind of prepares him um, for that return journey. 
So I think in this section of the poem, we really have something um, that I'm not saying Plato stole it or anything like that. I mean, we all we are all inspired by earlier thinkers that we read and we are influenced by them. I don't think it's thievery. Uh, but I think that in reading this poem as a whole, and especially this section and the section immediately before the path of seeming, we do get something that I believe would have inspired Plato uh, to speak the way he did of the cave analogy. Because again, we have the youth on the chariot brought to where the day meets the uh, night. Uh, and this is where he's going to receive the, the great um, revelation at this doorway when he steps through. Um, and also we have the goddess prepare him. Uh, because when he goes back uh, to the mortal realm or to the cave, uh, or wherever we're saying he came from, he's going to have to be familiar with all the um, scientific theories and arguments, because otherwise people are going to laugh at him. And the goddess does not want him to be outdone by those uh, back in the in the plain old normie world. She wants him to be a, familiar with their way of thinking and to be able to outrun them so that he doesn't get overthrown in arguments. Uh, so I think that's some very clear points that can be used to compare with uh, Plato's analogy of the cave. Again, not saying that there's anything bad about the cave being related this way. It's not about thievery. I just think it's very interesting if you want to look more into the cave to also look into this potential uh, comparison or point of inspiration. Uh, but the other thing as well here is, you know, we get to the paths of night and day. You know, for a lot of these pre-Socratic thinkers, and also if you're looking at um, East Asian uh, thinkers, there's something about opposites. So when they're thinking about metaphysics and, and what is and how things interact, there's a lot of talk about opposites like light and dark or I'm hot and cold. Um, if you if you were in my space with, um, we read through a text by Wang Bi, a, um, a, a Xuan Xue, like a Neo Taoist, I suppose you'd call him, or a mystery school person from the late Han Dynasty. But again, a lot of a lot of what we discussed there were opposites, hot and cold, night and day. You'll find in multiple pre-Socratic works as well, thought about opposites. And so night and day um, also represent, in a way, a sort of opposite. Uh, where is Parmenides receiving his revelation? Uh, again, I'm not, obviously I'm not the first to point out much, if any, of what I'm saying, but he is going beyond these opposites. He's stepping through the gate, I mean, pulled through the gate that justice will open for him. So the, um, so it's also going sort of beyond this dichotomy. So what Parmenides is going to speak of, now, I said I was pulling out sections that were of particular interest to me. Yes, that bit about the cave is particular interest to me because I'm often discussing Plato with people. And I'm not the most knowledgeable about Plato. I just think this is an interesting point and I use it in my discussions or when I talk to people about Plato. Um, but I also am interested here because not only am I trying to craft a Parmenides of meaning, which is why I highlighted things like a much speaking route, but also a Parmenides that's existential, talking about the whole. And so now he's going beyond dichotomy, beyond opposites, to speak of something broader. You know, he's not he's not just talking about day, or just talking about night, or just talking about the divine realm, or just talking about the mundane, you know, mortal realm. He's going beyond that dichotomy, stepping through this gate. Uh, well, being taken through the gate once uh, justice uh, gives him permission to go through. And so... You know, the top three lines of that second screenshot there, there that's really what um, stands out to me. But commentators and secondary source material, they often, I don't want to say harp on because that's dismissive, they're brilliant. I'm saying that they often highlight just how much detail uh, Parmenides puts into the doorway. Uh, again, kind of building up its significance, uh, crossing over beyond this dichotomy. Um, and also to that point we talked about earlier about this having signs of being some sort of religious procession or, or signs of some sort of mystery cult. Uh, you know, where we have the shrill sounds of a pipe and, and women pushing back their veils to see the revelation. Um, but there's also this great discussion of what the door looks like. Uh, and we're going to hear more of it as we read through this page. But um, if you are interested in that side of, hey, is Parmenides describing some sort of religious procession? Um, 
you know, these are some more details to focus on, how he's describing the door, how he's describing it's set in stone, um, how it opens in the brazen posts swinging and blah, blah, blah. It's, again, it's not my wheelhouse or why I read Parmenides, but there's a lot of, a lot of secondary source material and people find that really significant. And if you are interested in the religious procession or mystery cult angle, uh, again, the proem is, is golden. It's, it's absolutely invaluable because that's so much detail here about it. The, uh, the last uh, bit we read, so the ethereal gates themselves are filled with great doors. Again, more description of the door. And for these, justice, much avenging, holds the keys of retribution. So you have justice there, uh, and I, as usual, I butcher the pronunci pronunciation, but uh, you have Dicky, or Delta is the first letter there, Dicky, or Dicky. Uh, so justice, you can see in the Greek there. And, uh, you know, if we wanted to keep this theme of picking out everything that is a uh, poly, or much, or many, uh, we have the uh, much of engine here. Uh, but also one reason I stop on justice here, because look at this sentence, again, English, because that's what I rely on. It says, and for these, justice, much avenging, holds the keys of retribution. Now, obviously, I'm drawn to much avenging there because I want all potential talk of complexity or detail or plurality. But what really leaps out at here at me is um, I have a general interest in pre-Socratics. And um, why is justice appearing here? And... Why is she much avenging and holding keys of retribution? Like, why retribution? And why is she holding the keys to them? And what's her role here? And there is that earlier thinker that I mentioned uh, in the space that wasn't recorded. And I'll mention now. And I actually went and got the, um, the, the section to actually read. Uh, again, this is from Kathleen Freeman's Ancilla to the Pre-Socratic Philosophers. But Anaximander of Mil uh, Miletus... Again, a, um, a generation prior to Parmenides, I would say, maybe two generations prior to Parmenides. He's, um, he's around like the middle of the 6th century. And um, he writes, um, well, we essentially have lost almost everything that he wrote. But there's between three, one to three sentences that are preserved of direct quotes. And um, it's preserved actually by Simplicius, which is nice. Uh, my copy of this text doesn't say who it was preserved by on this page that I'm looking at, but I just know it was Simplicius, so whatever. Uh, preserved by Simplicius, and it's talking about the Aperon, or the unlimited, or the boundless. And this is his, um, sort of, his um, primordial, uh, I guess, primordial swamp or goop from which things come out of and from which, and to which things return. So he's describing that, and he says... Uh, the non-limited is the original material of existing things. Further, the source from which existing things derive their existence is also that to which they return at their destruction according to ne necessity. For they give justice and make reparation to one another for their injustice according to the arrangement of time. Now, I... Don't have the Greek for that quote from Anaximander or Simplicius in front of me. And even if I did, it's debatable how well I'd be able to understand or read it. But we have in Parmenides, and for these justice, much avenging, holds the keys of retribution. And in Anaximander, and I know from secondary source material, he's speaking in terms of almost like penal justice, you know, criminal justice almost. Um, the existing things derive their existence... Okay, wait, wait, wait. They give justice and make reparation to one another for their injustice. So, you know, there is this system in Anaximander whereby things are coming to exist and then this is a sort of an injustice almost. Um, the elements are kind of burped forth from the Aperon. This is almost kind of sort of an injustice that they have to pay back. So the elements get burp burped forth. This is one interpretation. They get burped forth. Uh, they combine to form objects or complex entities, and then they get dissolved, and eventually those elements then get reabsorbed by the apeiron. So it's like apeiron to elements to complex entities, and then this process 
of, let's say, injustice is repaid by then being broken down into the elements and then being returned to the Aperon. Now, I don't want to say that's the definitive and one only true understanding of an Aximander, um, but when you're reading this line in Parmenides where he's mentioning justice and the keys of retribution, I think there is shared language certainly there and um, it's just interesting because we know Anaximander is an older thinker than Parmenides um, and there does seem to be an interesting point of comparison that would be that one might want to make there um, especially if they were interested in Anaximander and wanted to see if they could scrounge together some more source material because Parmenides compared to Anaximander Parmenides is very well preserved uh, an Eximander, like I said, there's like maybe three sentences preserved of direct quotation. Uh, but yeah, interesting. Um, just, I, I obviously am more drawn to much avenging. Uh, but it is interesting to see why Justice might have been mentioned there. Because she's at the gates of night and day. And uh, night and day is going beyond the dichotomy. But now just thinking off the top of my head, you know, it's also going beyond maybe the world of our world of, of change or seeming or this hard to understand world and so if she holds the keys of retribution right there where would the gate be in an Aximander's system I guess the gate would be and again I'm someone who should not rely on my words on this point they should they should research the secondary source material and read the primary source material for themselves but piecing it together the gate where justice would be, I would assume, would be at the gateways of a pyron, where the things are coming forth and then ultimately returning, uh, justice being paid for. I mean, injustice being paid for, um, and so I think I think that's interesting as well. Parmenides has put justice at the gate of night and day, where you go beyond the dichotomy into this metaphysical teaching, or where things will be revealed to you. And uh, in in an Eximander, I suppose justice would be at that. Um, that point where the Aperon uh, is either birthing things or, or reabsorbing things. Because, you know, that's the role of justice. She she will, um, there will be retribution and what comes forward must come back. Uh, and that's where the justice is, right at that point where Aperon goes forth and comes back. Uh, so interesting. I think there's some, some things that can be explored there. Um, but I'll move on. So now the uh, the maidens who have been pulling the chariot are going to talk to Justice to try and get her to open that door to the realm, um, you know, beyond night and day or beyond this dichotomy or where this dichotomy meets. Coaxing her with gentle words, the maidens did cunningly persuade her that she should push back the bolted bar for them, swiftly from the gates. And these made of the doors a gaping gap as they were opened wide, swinging in turn in their sockets the brazen posts, fitted with rivets and pins. Straight through them at that point did the maidens drive the chariot and the mares along the broad way. So that's the end of that, um, that screenshot you have up there on that page. Um, you know, I think I, I spoke so much on the prior sections that I that I said everything I had to say about this section again notice how much is said about the door a lot is said about the door um, just detailing it and how it is opened uh, and again it's justice that gets to open or shut that door uh, which I think is is something interesting that could be compared with um, the justice in Anaximander's soul surviving you know section um, but also, just to be clear, there, there's a lot of um, testimonia about Anaximander. I don't want to pretend that there's just three sentences and we know nothing more. There, there is a lot of, um, I don't want to call them secondary sources because it's ancient source material, but there's a lot of testimonia. And there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. Uh, I don't want to get too far off track, but you've got everything from, um, you know, people evolving from fish um, to um, evolve is, you know, there's a lot of modern baggage that goes with that. So I'm being a little cheeky, but people coming from fish um, and, uh, you know, stuff about first maps being drafted, like maps of the world. And uh, we also have, um, I mean, there's so much to the guy. Um, why is the world stationary in the middle of the universe rather than falling? I mean, he says, you know, it's if it's equidistant from all points, then uh, it doesn't have any motivation to move in one point over another. There's like some interesting theories there, metaphysical theories there. 
Um, so interesting thinker, definitely worth checking out. And don't let me cause you to believe there's only three sentences. There's just three sentences of direct quotation. Uh, but, and again, it may be less, depends where you think the quote begins, but there's, there's a lot of testimonia. So don't make me um, trick you out of not reading Anaximander. Um, but there you go. See how justice is here, the one who closes and opens the gate, uh, just like justice is the one that's um, letting things move forward and then, I guess, seeking retribution and bringing it back into their payron. Uh, and also we see the procession continue. The maidens drive the chariot and mares along the broad way. And again, the broad way. So the, the uh, what, we, what did we have? We had the much speaking route of the goddess um, that carries us everywhere. Again, great, great terms that I, I like. I want this sort of language. Um, that that broad way is, uh, is continuing here. And so if we go to the next uh, next screenshot here, I, again, I have the book in my hand, but the um, it should be the three, third screenshot up there. We're going to see the meeting now. Finally, we get to the meeting. Uh, it's an unnamed goddess. And so here is the um, the youth is now going to describe um, his, his encounter. And the goddess received me kindly and took my right hand with her hand and uttered speech and thus addressed me. Youth attended by immortal charioteers who come to our house with mares that carry you. Welcome, for it is no ill fortune that sent you forth to travel this route. For it lies far indeed from the beaten track of men, but right and justice, and it is right that you should learn all things, both the steadfast heart of persuasive truth and the beliefs of mortal in which there is no true trust. But nevertheless, you shall learn these things as well, how the things which seem had to have genuine existence, permeating all things completely. There are, and, that, and that's the end of the, um, the proem. That's the end of the sections that I'll read today. But just on that last page, the, um, there is a, like some very significant material there that really, I think, supports my interpretation. At least I would, I would definitely quote in favor of my interpretation of the way of seeming. Uh, and the overall account of reality being given or provided by the goddess. And certainly that inspires me. And then I also find in, um, well, in that space we did on um, on the Xuan Xue scholar, his commentary or his essay. Uh, but let's start at the beginning. So those with the mystery cult uh, angle who want to, to see more, maybe they will read into how the, um, the goddess takes his right hand with her hand um, welcomes him to the house, the mares that carry him. You know, I again, I don't know that much about ancient Hellenic religion, but there are some extra details being given here of how they uh, first, how he first encounters the goddess and how the meeting with her begins. Um, I will, I will note that um, he's, it's, it's a, he's received kindly she welcomes him and says it's no ill fortune that sent you forth to travel this route uh, for it lies far indeed from the beaten track of men but right and justice so we already know this is far away from the regular mortal realm of the day-to-day -day of night and day this is he's gotten to the gate of night and day and gone beyond that dichotomy and has been received by the goddess either in this extra dimensional location or or in this location that is kind of beyond or, or subsumes both night and day. Uh, I'm a little cheeky there when I say subsumes both night and day. But basically it's it's a special place that I guess is fitting for a goddess and for a special revelation. And also for a religious mystery. Which is I, I imagine a special ceremony that you can't speak about too much and doesn't occur every day. Um, at least the greater mysteries I imagine wouldn't the um and she says it's 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 right and justice you know i i wonder why it's right and justice for him in particular to receive this um or right and justice to hear the truth um but the uh maybe 
Yeah, maybe it is just that right injustice to hear the truth or receive the truth or to be inducted into a mystery. Like if you are being inducted into a mystery, um, presumably welcomed kindly and brought in and told it's no ill fate to be here, it is right and justice to, to accept this, this, I guess, this new status or position or this knowledge or wisdom of reality. It's a great thing to be aware of that broader truth now. And, um, you know, what did they say about the Eleusinian mysteries? You know, the, you learn about life after death or eternal life. There's like some sort of great revelation about broader reality that you receive. And it's a great, um, it's a great um, thing to receive and makes you feel a lot better about the world. So, you know, that's sort of a right and justice of its own, I suppose. But, um, but what I really beeline to here. Um, and beelining is sort of gets people in trouble because then they beeline straight past the problem, right? Um, but what I beeline here to is the, um, or to here, is a, uh, here we go. She does say the beliefs of mortals in which there is no true trust. We've got the, both the steadfast heart of persuasive truth and the beliefs of mortals in which there is no true trust. Now, obviously we can point out after the problem, we have the text separated into two sections, right? The way of truth and then the way of seeming. Um, and so I suppose the way of truth is going to, going to be that steadfast heart of persuasive truth. And the way of seeming is going to be the beliefs of mortals in which there is no true trust. And when I was going over the different ways that Parmenides gets interpreted, um, you can see how this dichotomy or this separation into two two sections like a, a way of truth or a steadfast heart of persuasive truth and then a general belief of mortals in which you can't really put your faith um, there is that sort of split there um, and so someone like Simplicius is going to have that first section be these unchanging eternally true principles or whatnot or this realm of unchanging truth and then you're going to have that the beliefs of mortals in which there is no true trust is kind of that second layer shadow realm or world of illusions and often you'll, you'll hear people say that Parmenides said that there's no change and change is just an illusion um, you're not going to find anything in these fragments that says that there are that, or there is an illusion or that there is a realm of illusions um, but but that's a you can kind of see why they're saying that you got those two sections here but what really stands out to me and that I take here because remember, I want a Parmenides of meaning. I want to preserve something that we might call change. Like I, I, I agree that all of the accounts of change where old things go away and new things come to be, I absolutely agree that's all nonsense, it's gibberish, it's incoherent. You just toss it away. It's anything built on that is wrong, personally speaking. That's my belief. But remember... If there only is what there is, then whatever you're perceiving or feeling or aware of, you kind of have to put it in what is. You have to give it a place in existence. And so when the goddess says the beliefs of mortals in which there is no true trust, okay, I get it. The beliefs of mortals are those accounts of the universe like, oh, the um, the earth is the center of the universe and the sun spins around it and, you know, change is this process where old arrangements are destroyed and new ones come to be. Um, you can't put true trust in that. But what also does she say here that is very important to me? She says, I'm going to skip this first part. Nevertheless, you shall learn these things as well. Let me return to that. But she says, the things which seem had to have genuine existence, permeating all things completely. That term there, genuine existence, and that statement, permeating all things completely. I view that as a complete vindication or like a trump card where I say, ha, I've got the the one true meaning of Parmenides or the goddess. But there's something that is, there had to be something behind the beliefs of mortals. There had to be some truth that is being described. It had to have genuine existence. If it was all just illusions or shadows or, or gibberish, we're going to hear that you can't really speak of what is not. Um, there would just be nothing to say, nothing to describe. But there is something to be to, to describe. Uh, Nelson, I see you uh, have unmuted yourself. Did you have a comment or question? 
I'd just like to know, what is it that you believe in? I mean, do you believe in, um, in air, or do you believe in clouds? <laughs> All right. Well, I am going to address that very shortly. In the meantime, I'm just going to mute everyone. There we go. Uh, do I believe in air and clouds? Yes, I believe in air and clouds and everything else. I believe literally everything exists and there is only one way that things can be, and that is that they exist. Um, it's a little rude of me to take the mic away from you. Oh, you dropped out. That's sad. Uh, <laughs> but, but no, but look at this. Had to have genuine existence, permeating all things completely. And this is really... The had to have genuine existence goes to the beliefs of mortals in my interpretation. And it means that whatever our common beliefs are about change and whatever, the goddess is saying there's something genuine about them. Now, she says, in which there is no true trust. So we have to understand that although they have genuine existence in some sense or some way, you can't actually trust the account that these mortals are giving. Like something's gone wrong. They've either contradicted themselves, they've done something wrong in their description or in their beliefs. But I think you have to admit that their beliefs are based on something or possess some genuine existence. You can't call them illusions. You can't say change is just an illusion because an illusion is something. There is something that exists there that is being spoken of because to speak of something you kind of have to identify it or point to it. That's to be something to be spoken of, as we'll hear later on in the poem. So I think it's a very crucial bit there for me. And then she says, permeating all things completely. Um, you know, this may not be immediately obvious, but when we say that something like along the lines of, you know, there only is what there is. Well, that means that isness or what is permeates all things completely, right? There's nothing beyond it. There's nothing that escapes its its grasp that's not subsumed by it or that's outside of it. Isness or this principle of being or whatever we're ultimately going to land on as being the definition of being or, or the nature of being, it has to permeate all things completely. So not only do the beliefs of mortals in some sense have genuine existence, but to the extent that they, they latch onto anything at all, it all is. Isness permeates all things completely. Um, and, you know, I, I did mention we um, we read that um, East Asian essay from the end of the Han Dynasty. There's a... I've, I'm not going to say that Wang Bi or, or those Taoist thinkers are the correct interpretation of Parmenides. They're not, and they have some very fundamental ways in which they disagree. Uh, but there is a phrase in there that I found quite helpful for my own purposes, taking it out of its context in those Taoist thinkers who I had other disagreements with. But it was um, Bao Tong Tian Di. It's a, it envelops and threads through heaven and earth. There's this principle or this metaphysical principle that um, that threads through and envelops everything entirely. And I think that's kind of what's being said here. It permeates all things completely. There is this metaphysical isness or principle of being or this one thing that permeates all the details completely everything is assignable to it there's nothing that escapes it um, so that very last line of the problem there um, i would hate for people to miss that in their interpretation of parmenides because i think that is very that's a very crucial line in my opinion to how we are going to interpret uh the way of seeming versus the way of truth and um and obviously for me, it's it's going to be tying any coherence or meaning that we find in that way of seeming is going to be worked into the path of truth. Uh, and ultimately, the, the path of seeming is going to be abandoned. It's all just a path of truth in my interpretation. But that very last line there, uh, very crucial to me. And the last thing I'll say, as I've spoken way too much, um, I mean, honestly, this is just like three short pages. I could have read this in like five minutes, but there's so much... This, having been around for 2,500 years and having been an extremely popular or famous philosopher since day one, the um, there's a wealth of discussions and alternate interpretations and just debates, really, about what these things could mean, um, that every little sentence is almost its own little nugget of uh, evidence or truth or something inspiring. The um, But look at this. It says... Um, because we made the point about Plato's cave, right? 
not saying that Plato stole it or that Parmenides was thinking of a cave and coming at the end of the cave and then going back, but look at this line. But nevertheless, you shall learn these things as well. How the things which seem had to have genuine existence. Remember that, so drop off the permeating all things completely, because that's a different angle that I was discussing there. The new angle I want to take up now is, she's saying, regardless that there's no true trust in the beliefs of mortals, you're going to learn about them. And you're going to learn how the things which seem, the beliefs of the mortals, had to have genuine existence. That is to say, how the beliefs of mortals are going to get tied into the steadfast heart of persuasive truth, which is genuine existence. So she's going to say, you, one second, on this, can you, five more minutes. The, uh, she's going to say, the, um, you're going to learn about the path of seeming or the beliefs of mortals, and I'm going to get the bit that had to have genuine existence. That is to say, that ties it to the first road, in my interpretation, of course. And the, um, and also, as we said when I was discussing Plato, as I said, the um, one of the concerns that comes up in the Republic is how the person will be received when he goes back into the cave to talk to his old, I guess his old friends or his cave dwellers or troglodytes. So when the when the I guess enlightened troglodyte visits the common herd of troglodytes back in the cave, uh, he's going to get laughed at, right? Um, and what we'll see at the end of the path of truth, when we're going into the path of seeming, the goddess revisits this point about, nevertheless, you shall learn these things as well. Uh, she And she'll say, I'm teaching you them because, okay, they have no true trust. Um, but part of why I'm teaching you them is so that you can't be, um, you know, no one's going to run rings around you. They're not going to overthrow you when you go back to the mortal realm and tell them about the steadfast heart of persuasive truth. You're going to know how what they believe, you're going to know what they believe, you're going to have an account of their latest scientific theories and whatnot, um, and you're going to know, as this section here that we just read says, the genuine existence of them. That is to say, the part of them that is the steadfast heart of persuasive truth, or the extent to which they have identified something. That is to say, the genuine existence, or the steadfast heart of persuasive truth. So I think that if you did want to take up that line about, hey, how closely can we relate the cave of Plato's Republic to um, some of this proem, that's another bit you're going to want to go look at. Because again, you're going to have um, the person learning about what all the troglodytes believe in, and um, you're going to be able to identify to them uh, the parts that they ought to believe Oh no, I dropped out. Well, the um, I was ending there actually, it's all good. I was just saying, when the troglodyte has been uh, enlightened and he needs to go back, the, the priestess, or the goddess rather here, the goddess is saying, you know, I'm going to teach you what the troglodytes believe. I'm going to teach you how to relate their beliefs to genuine existence or the first path. And uh, you're not going to have them run rings around you and humiliate you in debate. Uh, so she kind of also... Uh, identifies that potential problem of uh, the youth when he returns back to mortal society or when the um, the man who has seen the sun returns and has to deal with his uh, his old friends, the troglodytes who remain. Um, so I think that's, uh, like I said, I didn't have any long notes or any anything really prepared. Uh, I had done the space once before when it wasn't recorded, but um, there's just so much rich material in the proem here. Um, and you'll note in the screenshot there, that um, that last line had to have genuine existence permeating all things completely is actually given in multiple different translations down here. Um, for example, I mean, there's there's translations down there that I find even more favorable. Um, I find them all favorable. Um, but you'll see like uh, Owens that says, how the things that seem had to have genuine existence being indeed the whole of things. Um, you know, it's... It's yeah. Some of these alternative translations, looking at them now, that they all work well for for my purposes, and um, another reason why I really recommend anyone who doesn't have a copy of Parmenides, or is brand new to it and just wants some sort of introduction that doesn't 
waste their time with like 300 pages of, of essays and commentary on prior thinkers uh, that have commented on him. It's really just a very great copy and gives you plenty of multiple translations here. And, uh, and that's honestly, I, I didn't have any notes on the, on the text itself to say anything beyond that. It's just, I read this, read it a number of times over the years, find it inspiring. And for my purposes, the purposes of extracting a, a sort of a Parmenides of meaning, uh, where I can accept that one core belief that I think all Eleatics accept, which is that reality is a perfectly complete whole. Um, I accept that. I agree with that. I, I accept all their criticisms of those who don't accept that or pretend to accept it and then, you know, step out and fail to honor that that point. Um, but I, but I, I think you have to preserve all the meaning that you perceive in that context. And so, therefore, I run into uh, some disputes with the other interpretations where they would either demote meaning to a secondary shadow realm or they would um, deny meaning altogether and say that reality is just a monotone hum and anything beyond that is, is just nonsense and we can't talk to each other. Um, and so the problem, it really is uh, its own little gold mine of uh, sections that, that can inform you. But also, as we saw, it can help inform some of your ideas about sections from other thinkers like Plato or Anaximander. And, uh, and if you just generally like uh, ancient theology or religious rituals and practices, um, I think I, I would assume that you'd get something out of this too. Just from the uh, descriptions of the procession, um, the veils being pulled back from the heads, and uh, the chariot with the shrill sound of pipes, and uh, this door being opened up, and the brazen post with rivets and pins and you get a real sense of an ancient religious procession or some sort of you know it, it, there's a lot that i think a person interested in ancient religion would get from that um so there's multiple reasons to read the proem uh and i have to confess as a when i was first encountering parmenides i didn't discard it or not read it but it really didn't grab me because i i thought i had uh, a particular interest in the path of truth and went straight to uh, the path of truth. Um, but then when you encounter the interpretations and really have to discuss it, you, you need to have a more holistic understanding of, of Parmenides' work and all the surrounding material. And much of that um, will be enriched by reading the problem. So I'll leave it at that. Um, it's recorded this time, thankfully. Um, I'll also throw it up on YouTube. So that'll be nice. Um, I have a little channel. It's nothing special. But when I do a space, I, I save the recording and I put it up there just in case Twitter bugs out or it um, decides it has to delete all our tweets. Um, if anyone wants to say anything or make a comment, feel free to request the mic. Otherwise, I'll probably end it there. It's been, um, it's been let's see, almost an hour and a half. It's pretty good. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll be quiet for a moment. If anyone requests, great. If not, that's also great. I'll, uh, I'll just end the space. All right, perfect. Thank you all for being here. You know, I've, I've wanted to do it since I did it the first time and realized I didn't record it. I was just thinking, ah, oh, how did I somehow manage to turn off the recording function? <laughs> but but now it's finally uh, it, it's finally actually there for people to listen to if they wish. And like I said, I will chuck it up on uh, YouTube and post a link at some point. And hopefully the audio quality will uh, be pretty good. Thank you all for being here. And uh, maybe I'll be around some spaces later tonight. I mean, Friday is always interesting. I don't see RS here, but sometimes RS does a really great space on Friday. If you ever catch those, definitely check them out. Um, but I'll be around, and hopefully on uh, either tonight or sometime on the weekend, there'll be some good spaces. Uh, I'll see you all later. Bye.